Hey, good morning, Southbridge family. Hey, Ben, if you are in the room, thank you for being here on time. That's pretty awesome. A uh, number of folks still outside making their way in. Uh, if you can hear this, because they probably cranked it up a little bit in the foyer, come on in and join us. Uh, we have a number of people joining us online this morning. Thank you so much for, for just being with us in, in that way. You can make some comments there and uh, let us know how we can pray for you. Just check in. Let us know that you're there with us and, and how we can minister to you. Uh, if you're in the room, I, I just love to say there's nothing like being in the room. Amen? Man, there's just something as we gather together as the body of Christ and and uh, just experience his presence together. Uh, his presence doesn't live in this place. He comes with us because he lives in us. And so this is a room, but as we gather in this room, we do so with a sense of purpose and a sense of intentionality. My name is Dave Borley. I'm one of the pastors here. And it's just a joy to serve Christ with you as we desire to reach our city for Jesus Christ. Uh, I want to just point out a couple of things really fast. In the uh, seat back in front of you, uh, you'll see a, a card that looks like this. Uh, it's our Connect card. We would love for everybody in the room, uh, online, you can do this as well. Uh, you can scan that little QR code. If you don't know what a QR code is, you were born before 1980, probably. Um, but that funny little thing, you can scan that with your phone and you can pull up our, our Connect form. Uh, we would love for everyone to do that. Just let us know how we can love you, how we can pray for you. Maybe you have questions. Maybe you're interested in, in believers' baptism. We got baptism coming up in just a couple of weeks. And, uh, you know, or you just share a prayer request or update some information. Uh, we'd love to be able to, to touch base with you and, and uh, just minister to you any way that, that you need. Um, you can get some more information, sfchurch.com. Lots of things coming up for Easter. Easter Jam this Wednesday, Good Friday's coming up. We've got a, a 12 noon Good Friday service where we're going to take the Lord's Supper together and just have, have a great time celebrating in a meditative fashion. Three services on Easter, different times, so make sure you check that out uh, so that you're not coming at the wrong time. We have some off-site parking, so if you're regular here at Southbridge, we would love for you to use our off-site parking to accommodate and open up some space on our campus for a number of guests that are probably joining us. Uh, but uh, any guys in the room? Come on, I know you cheered louder last night, didn't you? There's been a lot, there's been a lot of screaming going on this week through all the tournaments and, and uh, a lot of us getting fired up for the NCAA champion, the tournament that's, that's rolling. But here's guys, listen to me. I want to invite you tonight. Uh, we're going to jump right back in this room. We're going to eat uh, some, some barbecue. Uh, we're going to enjoy some time together. We're going to fellowship. We're going to press in together as God's men. Not just for a gathering, but to form a movement of biblically healthy, biblically strong men that are going to lead us to help reach our city. And so I want to invite you to be a part of that. Uh, if you're a guy and you know who you are, you come and be with us. Uh, you can sign up online. Maybe you want to come and not eat. Just show up, okay? Uh, we're just going to trust God with, with the food. We had a bunch of guys out yesterday smoking a bunch of meat. And, um, we're, but we're just going to be right here, 6 to 7.30. Uh, it's just going to be a good time of fellowship, but also a challenge as we rally together as men of God. Are you a man of God? Let's gather as men of God as we uh, simply see, seek the face of God and seek to reach our city. We're stepping into a time of, of worship, and worship is not just singing, amen? But we're gonna begin to sing, we're gonna begin to lift our voice and praise to the Lord. As we do, we're, we come for Him. We are here for Christ. Psalm 148, the psalmist says, praise the Lord, praise the Lord from heavens. Praise Him in the heights above. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His heavenly hosts. Get this, He says, praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you shining stars. Praise Him, you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Let Him praise the Lord, for He commanded and they were created. He commanded, His very voice created all things. Psalm 148, 13 says, Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens. 
When, when we come and we say, God, we are here for you, it's not simply because we, we want to come and do our duty for him. It's that we want to come and we want to abide in his presence. We want to give him the praise that he is due. Amen? God, we are here for you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we offer him our time this morning. Father, as we gather in this place, we are here for you because you are worthy of our praise. And God, we know that as we come into your presence that you will meet us in this place. And Lord, we ask you to do that. We ask you to inhabit our praise. We ask you to teach us through the presence of your Holy Spirit as we open your word. And Father, I invite you personally to, to speak to me, minister to me through the presence of your spirit. And Father, I invite you to do that and ask you to do that with each person here, each person in the sound of my voice, each person that's tuning in with us online. Father, would you meet us as we come for you to praise you in Jesus name. We lift up your name. Amen. Let's stand as we sing together this morning.
welcome in here today.
the saints. All the saints and angels, they bow before your throne. And all the elders cast their crowns before the Lamb of God and say that you're worthy of it all. of 
for all that you have done. We praise you today. God, so often it's, it even says it throughout scripture that man looks at the outward appearance, but you look to the heart. And God, when we look back and recount all the things that you have done for us, the blessings, the ways that you provide, it's so easy for us to quickly look at the things that we can see the physical ways that you provide for us. But Lord, the, the greater miracle is the spiritual ways that you have provided for us. God, you have truly brought us back to life, just like Lazarus. Lord, we were dead in sin, but you, once again, you breathed your breath of life into us again. And you've called us from death to life. And we're so grateful, Lord. We're so grateful that when we are in you, Lord, we are filled with the Holy Spirit. God, it's no longer us who lives, but you live within us. We welcome you in today, Father. God, and my prayer is that as we do that, you would transform us from the inside out. God, that as we do that, as we create more space for you, Lord, that we would look more like you to the world around us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. All God's people said together, amen. You guys can go ahead and be seated. Good morning, Southbridge. Glad you guys are here today. I'm excited to continue our church, our, our series, Church Reimagined. Um, and uh, while we're, before we get started, I want you to bring to mind the first person you know who got an iPhone. So 17 years ago, um, for me, uh, I, ha I was in high school. For some of you, that makes me really young. For some of you, that makes me old. Um, but I was in high school, and a girl in my class got one, and I remember thinking, holy cow, that thing is crazy expensive. There's no way the touchscreen's gonna work. And there's way better cameras. It's like, this just, it seems just like a fad. Um, so to quick check on Danny's high school uh, predictions, how many people here in this room have an iPhone? Okay, all right, so maybe not the most reliable source back then. Um, but for whatever it's worth, I have an Android today. I'm happy about that. Shout out to all the Androids in the room. <laughs> I'm the person who makes your text threads green, and um, I'm proud, I am proud to be that person. Um, <laughs> anyways, but the reason I bring this up is because the iPhone, um, it, was a, it, was, it created a paradigm shift. You know, for, for those of you who are young and in this room and you can't remember a world without them, you look at your parents, you're like, how did you get a place without a GPS on your phone? And how did, 
what were you supposed to do with pictures? I mean, think about pictures. Pictures were in shoebox. You lost pictures because they were in shoeboxes in your closet and you couldn't remember them. Whereas now you lose pictures because you have so many that you can't really go back and search them, right? And AI is going to solve all of it for us, right? Uh, but, uh, but the thing is, with this iPhone, it, it created this paradigm shift that everything in our world operates based off the assumption that everybody has a smartphone. Like, you're the exception, you're not the norm. When we got that first iPhone, that wasn't what it was. We were just like, what are the possibilities? And so we've been in this series studying the book of Acts, and it's really important for us to remember, as we study the book of Acts, they're getting their iPhone 1s, and we're looking back at it with our iPhone 15s. You know, so their screen time is what yours used to be, and, and our screen time is now, what it, whatever, you can go look at it right now, it's probably, average person is what, six, eight hours at this point, right? And, and so, it's, as we're thinking about church and we're reading about the church, it's really important as we read these passages to remember we're not supposed to just do everything that they did in these passages. But it was in their context, it was brand new to them, but it's also important to remember that we're bringing our own baggage with us from all these changes and, and living in America in the 21st century of our own baggage as we're looking at it. And, and so it's a different problems, but very much so related. And so let's look at our text today. It's Acts chapter six. And while you're looking, I'm going to go ahead and kind of give you a recap to catch you up to what's happened thus far in the book of Acts. The book of Acts starts with a resurrected Jesus. He's died, he's come back to life. And he comes and he goes to teach his disciples and they're like, oh wow, he's alive. And he commissions them. This is what Jesus says to them, Acts chapter one, verse eight. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So Jesus says, wait till the Holy Spirit comes and then you're gonna get power and you're gonna make me known everywhere. So they go and they wait and they hide and they pray and then the Holy Spirit pours out upon his followers, and then they go out into Jerusalem. It happens to be a day where there's a festival where there's Jews from all over the world speaking all different languages who are there, and everyone can understand Peter clearly, and they preach, and people are saved, thousands upon thousands, and they come, and they gather, and they start trying to do what church is. But what you have to remember is they hadn't done church before. Right? They'd gone to synagogue, and so they're just trying to figure out, okay, based off of what Jesus said, how Jesus lived, how Jesus led us, what are we supposed to do? And we see some really great things uh, in Acts chapter 2, verse 44. It says, all the believers were together and had everything in common. That's a big theme throughout the beginning of the book of Acts. They're, they're gathering, they have everything in common. And then in chapters 3 through 5, um, 3 up until 6, where we are today, what you see is uh, there's persecution of the church. You see there's generosity continued. You see there's people lying about generosity. And what you realize is like church starts to become more and more real. And you, I mean, you just keep reading in the New Testament. There's all sorts of conflict with the church and that's what a lot of those letters were addressing. And so today's a point in which we're reading about where stuff started to get real, where there started to be some tension within the church. And we get to, we get to see this front row of like, okay, are they going to go and they're going to be distracted or are they going to choose to be devoted to Jesus? And that's, that's the mess title for today and that's just the thought that I want you to think of. It's like, are we going to be distracted or devoted? And so as we read this today, please keep your eyes out and see what the Lord has for you. Starting in chapter 6, verse 1. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because of their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and we will give our attention to the prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. And so there's this tension point. Are they gonna get distracted by this internal conflict or are they gonna to move forward? And like I said, remember, we're looking at this with iPhone 15s. We're not, we're not in the same situation. They're trying to figure out church, and we're looking back. And so we bring our own culture, our own context, everyone in here. If you've been to another church, you're bringing your church history to this space. 
And so we need to study this God's word to see what he has for us in our context, in our place today. And that's why we're here in this series, because we want to do church the way God intended it. We want to connect people to, to Jesus for life change, and we want to do that together. Um, and so the first thing that you're going to see as you, as you look at this passage is that we shift from fractured to family. The church has to shift from fractured to family. You see this tension here? There's the Hebraic Jews and the Grecian Jews. Look at verse 1. You'll see those two groups. And there's these two groups. And, and to us, you're like, well, they're both Jews. There should be some similarities. And there are. But there's a bigger difference than I think you or I would have realized if we hadn't studied this together. And, and, and the big difference is that the Hebraic Jews, these are the people who the majority of Jesus' ministry was to. These are the, the Jews who lived in Israel and Jerusalem. They spoke Aramaic. That's what everybody in that region spoke. That's where they were from. They were, they were Jews who were already a part of the religious systems and, and of that place, of, of that city, and, and where they were. And they were involved. And if you want to think of an example of that, think of Nicodemus, right? He, he was a Pharisee. He was, he was Jewish. He was from that town. And so, and so and we're also remembering we're in the early church. And so there wasn't this clear distinction. Oh, there's Jews and there's Christians, right? For, for the Roman Empire, they were confused. They're like, there's this weird Jewish sect that's starting. They didn't even have a name. Later on in Acts, they start being called people who follow the way. But there's this clear, there's this, de- like, it's not clear who's following Jesus. Is this the same thing? Is it different? It's, it's all being figured out. And, and these first six chapters happen over about two years, just for some context there. And so, and so these, these Hebraic Jews can kind of blend in with the culture. And not even in a bad way, but just because they speak the language. They were already a part of the institutions and structures that were already there. That is not the same for the Greek Jews. The Greek Jews were either people who had converted to Judaism, so they were from the Roman Empire, and they lived somewhere else, and they heard about Yahweh, and they said, I'm going to follow him, and then they heard about Jesus, and I'm going to follow him. Right? And, and so they're already an outsider, or they're maybe a Jewish family that left Jerusalem, moved out, and then came back eventually. And what you see is there's not just this cultural difference, but there's also a language barrier. They didn't speak Aramaic, they spoke Greek. And actually, many Greek Jews and their um, Grecian Jews, towards the ends of their lives, would move to Jerusalem to be near the city, to be in the Holy Land, as, towards the end of their lives because that was where the temple was, kind of that. And so it makes sense that there's widows there. And so there's this tension. And the tension isn't just between people who are similar. It's very different. And on top of that, for the Grecian Jews, the other piece to really think through is that they were already outsiders. They're living in a town where everybody spoke a different language. And so as outsiders, they were quite easy to blame when all the Jesus stuff came out. And so quickly, they were the ones who were first to be persecuted, and there's this moment in the church where there's this conflict that arises, and the question is, what's going to happen? How are they going to operate? And you see that they could be a fracture, but they choose to operate as family. And when I say family, I want you to think about, um, there's, there's just this idea of family in our culture is, is actually kind of watered down, because when you think about family, most of us think about our nuclear family, like from from zero to 18, or nowadays it might be to 24 and your parent, and, the, and their parents, and then you spread out, and then you come, get together on holidays. But that's actually not really what family is. Family is much more than that, right? You have extended family, you have things beyond, and, and really what family is, family is a group, of, a group of people who have a greater purpose than their, their individual purposes. And a great way to illustrate that is a, a funny thing that happened in my house uh, the, just the other day. Uh, we have Three boys, six, four, and two, and it was dinner time. I was looking at the clock. I was like, oh, you know what? I think today we have time. It'd be a great opportunity to teach my kids a game. And so my six-year-old, he loves games. He understands them. He can do all the, most of the things required for most games, so he's great at them. My four-year-old's along for the ride. He'll have fun. The two-year-old's not quite ready. And I was like, well, he'll just sit in mom's lap. He'll kind of be on her team, or he'll sit in my lap, whatever. Well, I forgot that my wife had a, a work call during this point. And so she had to go disappear. And it was now me with all three boys. And the other important detail is that dinner, the older two ate their dinner great, the younger did not. And sometimes in our house, if you eat dinner great, you get a piece of candy after, after dinner. And when you don't, you don't. And when, when a two-year-old doesn't get a piece of candy and he sees his brother get a piece of candy, you can imagine what might happen. Um, right? He decided to make everybody else's lives miserable until he got what he wanted. And so I'm sitting here as a dad of like, with this tension of like, man, 
my six-year-old, I know he would love this. I want to serve him. I want to play this game with him. And, and my, my two-year-old's over here screaming at me, making a fit. It's like, what's the tension? I, I, can't, I can't make everybody happy because I, I can't give him a piece of candy and he's not going to eat, but I might give him attention and that could distract him. But then my six-year-old's going to be like, dad doesn't ever give me attention. <laughs> you know, like there's that tension you feel as a parent. And so the Lord worked it out. The two-year-old climbed on the counter, knocked the candy down, ate as much as he wanted. No joke. <laughs> um, um, and, and so now I've created fracture with uh, my future parenting skills and other things with him doing that. But, but you guys see it, right? You can't lift up. There's tension in a family, right? You can't just put, can't just always prioritize everybody. And so within family, there's moments where you got to sacrifice for each other. And that's hard because we're told it's all about you. That's what our culture tells us. But what we see the early church is, is they don't lean into that, right? There's this moment where there's this tension of like, right, that it's in complete contrast what you've seen in, in earlier in Acts. I read 2.44 earlier, uh, chapter 4, uh, Acts 4.32, very similar, right? They, if you look behind me on the screen, they had everything in common. And all of a sudden, they don't. The widows don't have everything in common. And it's this point of fracture, this tension. And on top of that, we don't really know. We know they're saying they're not getting enough food, but if you guys have ever been in leadership, especially if you've, I used to run an after school. So if you've ever led large groups of kids, maybe you serve at Bridge Kids, there's all these moments where people come to you with conflicts and you're like, I don't know what happened. Uh, you know, I, I was actually, uh, one of the kids who I used to run in the after school, he was, he, came, he, I, he, uh, he was here at the first service, and he came up to me, and he was telling me his story about where that happened. Um, he came to me, and there was another kid, and there was a conflict over, hey, this guy hit me. Well, he hit me first, right? And there's that tension. And you're, and you're like, I don't think this kid, he doesn't usually do that. It doesn't make sense. I'll probably do that. But then you're like, maybe he's just a better liar than the other one, right? right? There's this tension. And, and the, the point is, we're in this moment where whether it's real or perceived, there's a difference. And the difference is clearly defined by which tribe they're a part of. And that tribe is getting in the way of them growing. It's, it's really interesting. This passage ends by saying, so the word of God spread. So as a result of what they did here, the word of God spread, as a result of choosing to live as family. And so it's really interesting, you look at verse five, it said, this is, listen to it again. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit also, Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. Those names are all Greek names. And notice that the apostles didn't choose those guys. They chose them. The people chose them. So they said, you know what? The Hebraic Jews said, you know what? Out of a love for you, we're going to submit to you, and we're going to show you that this is not intentional. This is not our heart. We're going to let you guys choose the leaders. What a beautiful picture of family. And the, the thing is, when we come to our iPhone 15 world, it's crazy because you can look at church across America in our context, and that's one of the most fractured places. You, you don't have to look, I mean, the culture's fractured too, but you don't have to look for the church. You know, there's the classic old battles of pews versus chairs and hymns versus hip songs and color the carpet, but you've also got Baptist, Charismatic, Episcopalian, Methodist, insert a denominational name that's insulted that I didn't include them in the list, right? And, 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 and it's funny, I, at Southbridge, we have people from all those backgrounds. But that's not how God intended his church to be. He intended us to be unified. And it's crazy that our, our disunity is a reflection of our culture. I mean, think of Raleigh. We're fractured as it is. You know, there's NC State and all the teams NC State beat on the way to the championship, um, yesterday, right? There's that fracture. Obviously, I'm joking there, and you can ask Dave and Scott. That was in my notes before they won. Um, but, uh, but, but we are fractured. Our culture is fractured. You know, there's, there's the obvious ones. There's race, politics, class. There's an election this year. And so many people want to identify with their tribe of which lane they run in, and they want to be surrounded by people like that. And it's so interesting that the solution wasn't, all right, we're going to have a, a, a Hebraic section and we're going to have a Greek section. 
It was like, we're going to put Greek leaders over it. It's not to say that they didn't get small and, and obviously language and all those things, but they were unified. They were operating as family. And what's also interesting is they don't force one to look like another. They don't say, hey, Greeks, you're going to have to speak Aramaic. Or Aramaic, Hebrew, Hebraic Jews, you're going to have to speak Greek. And that's a reflection of what the kingdom is going to look like. Uh, in Revelation 7, verses 9 and 10, John is describing all of the saints standing before and worshiping God. And listen to this description. After this I looked, and before me there was a great multitude that no one could count. So many people he couldn't count them. From every nation, every tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne, and in the Lamb of God, they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in hand, and they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. It was a picture of diversity, worshiping in unity. That's who God has called us to be. Not to be fractured, but to be family. Because Jesus wants him to be the stumbling block. Not who you vote for, not who you associate with, but is Jesus the stumbling block for people coming to know him when he looks at the church? And that's a challenge for us, because we're not good at it. But that's why, as a part of our vision, a huge piece of that is how do we start to partner with more churches? We're not in it alone. Southbridge isn't in it alone. We're in it with all of the other churches here trying to make Jesus' name known in our city. From fractured to family. And the second shift that they're having to make here is from receivers to risk takers. From receivers to risk takers. Do you notice that there's this conflict that arrives, arises, and they go to the disciples, and they think, you know what, how do we solve this? We're going to go to the disciples, the apostles. They were with Jesus. The apostles surely are going to know what to do. They're the closest to God. So they go to the apostles, and it's really fascinating because the apostles go, you guys solve it. You go pick it up. And, and the reason is because they're trying to do church the way they'd always done church. You see, in their culture, they had priests. Most, most cultures throughout history have had them. We don't really have them unless you're Catholic or Orthodox, and, and even then, they don't really have a great reputation in our culture. But really what a priest was and who a priest to them would be would be this really holy person who's close with God, who can stand between me and God, and when I need something from God or I need to give something to God, I'll go to that person and they'll work it out for me or they'll tell me what to do. And that's why priests, they always worked in temples. Why? Because in, in the temple is where God's presence was. And so they go to the, they're like, well, we don't have priests anymore, but who do we have? We have the apostles. They follow Jesus around. We're going to go to them. And so they go to these apostles and they say, hey, we need you to stand between us and God. We have this tension between us. Can you solve this? And the apostles look at them and say, hey, that's not who we were called to be. We have, God has given us specific gifts and talents and abilities to go do this. You go solve this. Going back to Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Every follower of Jesus has the Holy Spirit, every single one, and he has empowered us. Their culture, they, were, they, they have been trained to be receivers. I'm going to bring something to the temple and I'll get something from God. I'll receive it. What the apostles are saying is, no, go out. And there's such a great picture of this. As I was preparing, Dave pointed this out, and I was like, ah, i got to include this for sure, is, is if you hearken back to when Jesus has his disciples and he, and he is teaching to a crowd of over 5,000 people. This is in Mark chapter 6. Let me read it to you. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. By this time, it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said. It's already really late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take eight months' wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you, said, do you have, he asked. Go and see. When they found out, he said, five and two fish. Right? Jesus had been in the same exact situation with the disciples. They came to him with a problem. Jesus said, you solve it. They were like, I'm out of cash, sorry. Uh, 
And the, and the funny thing is, in the end, Jesus is the one, right, who multiplies the fish and the loaves. But the disciples are different people now than they were then. And they learned from Jesus, right? Now they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And now they know the people coming to them are filled with the Holy Spirit. And they say, hey, you guys pick some people to resolve this. It's so easy to come to church, right? They were doing church the way that they knew it, that they'd been taught. Go to the priest. The priest is going to figure this out for you. Even in the Jewish culture, the priests were the ones who gave out food and money to the widows. So it made sense. But the disciples said, no, there's been a paradigm shift. You're no longer receivers. You're now risk takers. You need to own this piece of ministry. And it's really, if you, if you think about it, it might be kind of confusing that I'm using the word risk taker because you might think, well, they're just kind of doing an administrative task. It's, it's who's going to manage the money and, and the funds and make sure it's even and maybe someone with some discretion who can know, well, this situation is different than that and, and there's some wisdom in there. But it's really interesting that we don't really hear much about these guys, especially the um, the last five guys, we don't really hear anything else about them. We assume that they faithfully served in that way and blessed people. But the first two guys that are mentioned, Stephen and then Philip, are almost the next two stories in Acts. They're right after this. And what you don't hear about is you don't hear about Stephen and Philip being really good at, and smart about giving food out. What we hear about is we hear that Stephen, he stands up, preaches in front of a lot of people who are very against him. And he gets martyred. He gets stoned for it. And then shortly after that, God whisks Philip away in a wind, puts him down in front, of, in, in front of this huge caravan and says, hey, go talk to that Ethiopian eunuch. He goes and he talks to him and the gospel goes out beyond Jerusalem into Ethiopia to the nations, to the world. Acts 1-8 coming true. That first step of obedience was a huge, important point for them, right? And like I said, all this happens over a period of time. It's not like the next day this happened. It's, it's over two, or two plus years. But it's, it's just so important to remember, like they had to take this step and the Lord met them in that. And it's so easy at church, in our culture, in our context, with our iPhone 15s, and churches like ourselves, even at times, have structured ourselves around it to make it where you just can come to church and receive, and some of you, when I say that, I don't just mean people who just come attend and go home. I mean people who are serving. Because so many of us think, you know what, I'm going to check that box or I'm going to earn God's favor or his love. I'm going to offer the sacrifice of my time to show God that I love him. But that's not what God has called us to do. He has called us to be risk takers, to obey the spirit and to live into that and do it out of an overflow of love and an overflow of what he is doing in our hearts. The way we say that at Southbridge is our personal spiritual transformation leads to the gospel saturation. Right? This story is about something that happens internally within the church. But then the end result of the story is, so the Lord added to their number daily. And it's even fascinating, you look at Verse seven, you see on the screen behind me, who are some of the people who are, this is making sense for all of a sudden? Priests. They get it. Everyone is empowered. Everyone has the spirit. Hebrews chapter 14 talks about it this way, talking about Jesus. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we possess, profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find the grace to help us in our time of need. You do not need someone standing between you and God. That is so important to remember. There's so many things and lies that we tell ourselves. I'm not good enough. I'm not spiritual enough. Whatever that is, you don't need somebody between you and God. He's there and he's available to you. And so this paradigm shift from being a receiver to a risk taker, what does that look like in our context as someone who's a part of Southbridge, one of the ministries that I lead here is outreach. That's reaching out. How do we share the gospel and make Jesus, connect people to Jesus for life change in our community? 
And one of the things that we want to continue to get better at, and you've been hearing me talk about this, is how do we empower you to do the work of the ministry? Uh, many of you guys have participated when we've done our fall outreaches before, where on Halloween we want to equip you to go love your neighbors really well. How do we ma- help you take it from, a, from an A stand to an A plus stand where you can love on your neighbors and they think, why do you care about me so? Or you get to have a bounce house where your kids play and you get to have a conversation with your neighbor and show them that you love them. Right? It's more of that. Because imagine if in a few years people don't, Think of, when they think of Southbridge, they're not, they don't think of us because we have great kids programs, even though we hope to still have that, or, or because we have great ideas that is how to do outreach in our city. But they know that if someone is a part of Southbridge, they have eyes for the community, and they have eyes to love and show Jesus' love to everyone around them. And that's true in a lot of ways. I mean, I have, this was probably a little over a year ago, I have a neighbor, she has two small kids, it was pouring down rain one day, and somebody from Southbridge, I'm not quite sure who it was, walked with her to her car and held his umbrella over them, her so while she buckled her kids in. Like eyes to see. But imagine if your small group came around someone who's homeless and came and loved them. You know, all of our homeless shelters are full. It takes days to get in. So how do you do that when you engage that? What if your neighbor's tree falls through their deck and they can't replace their deck, and your group goes and you help them rebuild. What does that look like? Because I'm never going to know about that. The church is never going to know about that. But imagine if all 1,000 people here who are going to be here this morning have eyes and are out and engaged, and we want to be a church who empowers that to help you come shift from being a receiver to being a risk taker, to take those risks in the lives you see around you. And as you're thinking through this, back to just kind of this series and thinking through kind of peeling back the curtain, um, we have staff meetings on Monday. And on Mondays in the staff meetings, we like to celebrate what God is doing. And so people share just different good things that the Lord is doing. So first of all, if you ever have those, please just share those with staff members because I'd love to hear about it through them. Um, but one of the things that we have cons- I have consistently heard over the last couple months is from our student ministry and how God is working there. As they've been thinking through, okay, how do we reimagine what has been going on in student ministry? How do we align it to be more like church, to have church more like God intended, to be intentional about discipleship? What they've done is they've created this student leadership team. They basically went to their students and they said, hey, we're going to start to give you some of these tasks and these roles on our, during our student gatherings that some of our adult leaders used to do. And so then the adult leaders were like, okay, so now what do you want us to do? And, and DJ and his team were like, now you get to spend your time relationally investing in these students. And the crazy thing is, just like in this story, the stories that I hear DJ telling about is less about the leaders and it's less about the tasks that the students are doing. It's actually about how the Lord is working through those students and how they're impacting their peers, how when somebody new comes in, they welcome them in a way that wasn't true before and how they're taking their discipleship seriously. What if our whole church did that, not just our student ministry? It'd be so incredible the impact it could have on our city to move from fractured, to move from just being a receiver, from being distracted, to devoted followers of Jesus from distracted to devoted. And it's so interesting because the thing that they look for, the disciples, they only put one condition. They say, hey, you go pick them as long as they're full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. That was the, that was the parameters. Do they walk with Jesus? Are they devoted followers? It wasn't, do they have the, do they have the, the resume? It wasn't, are they politically the right people in the group? Are they full of the Spirit and wisdom? It's a great question to be asking about ourselves. Are we full of the spirit and wisdom? And at Southbridge, kind of, kind of the way we frame all three of these things is this idea of, do I enjoy God fully? Am I devoted? Do I take a risk, right? Am I moving from that receiver to that risk taker? Do I live as family? Those, those pieces we think, okay, that is what a holistic disciple of Jesus is. And it's not that you ever arrive in any one of those spaces, it's that you're growing in all of them. 
But so many of us can easily have a deficit. I think a couple weeks back, Pastor Dave had all those triangles. If you remember, there were all these different shaped triangles. But it's really important to remember, their starting point was, are you devoted? We're looking for men who are full of the Spirit and wisdom. Are you devoted? And then the natural overflow of that devotion was risk-taking. Stephen preaching, Philip sharing the gospel with the Ethiopian eunuch. And then the natural overflow of that was, as the church was in tension, there was a fracturing moment. Were they going to fracture? No. They're going to live as family. That's the whole idea of who we want to be as a church. What we see our church becoming in our city is a place where personal spiritual transformation starts here, and it goes out into our city where the gospel is saturated. One of my very favorite verses is Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Uh, It's one that I think about a lot. I've memorized it. I meditate on it. And the reason is because there's this juxtaposition in it. Uh, Peter and John have just performed a miracle, and they've been arrested and are standing before the council. And here's the first half of the verse. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. For they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. So they're like, these are average Joes. How are they doing miracles? What's going on? I'm not quite sure what's happening. And then here's the next part of the verse. But they also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. Are you someone that people recognize you as having been with Jesus? Because that, that is the foundation, that is the starting point of where God works in us, the rest is the natural overflow of that, the spiritual transformation that leads to saturation. But do you look like someone who has been with Jesus? And that's a hard thing to do. And at Southbridge, one of the ways we do that is is by getting smaller and with small groups and and really one-on-one relationships. You've heard Pastor Dave say, half a step ahead and moving. Look for somebody who's half a step ahead of moving in front of you and maybe a half a step behind you to bring with you. To work on these three things, right? Live as family, enjoy God, take a risk. Walk with them in that journey. And help them, help yourself, and let the Spirit work in all of you to be someone who looks like you've been with Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for everyone in this room. I thank you for our church and the way that you work in our lives and that you've rescued us. And I just pray that in, from that, we would be devoted to you. We would enjoy you fully, that we would just receive what you have for us, Lord, and not out of obligation, but out of love, out of the new person that we have become, that we would take risks and live as family. Jesus, we need you, and we can only do it with the Holy Spirit guiding us. So God, fill us with your spirit. Send us out. Give us eyes to see the needs in our city. Give us eyes to see the sin in our heart and grow us closer and closer to you. Amen. Let's go and stand together. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire, time after time. I'm born of his spirit, I'm washed in his blood. He
fail Perfect submission
And it's, it's hard not to enjoy God fully with worship like this. Um, I'm DJ Crownrath. I'm the student pastor here. And um, I just wanted to encourage you guys with Pastor Danny's message about maybe some of you guys are in that stage of being a receiver and God's trying to empower you to be a risk taker. Um, some of you maybe are risk takers already, but you're not doing it with anyone else. You're alone and you need to live as family. Um, some of you guys, maybe you're listening to Enjoy God, fam or Enjoy God Fully, and you just need to really enjoy Him uh, in this moment in your life. Wherever you are at, we welcome you. We're glad you're here. Um, but maybe God's trying to show you some other areas to grow. Um, as Pastor Danny said in the student ministry, it's been such a blessing for myself, our student associate, Madison, just to see a student leadership team grow in a, a way that we couldn't even have fathomed. We wanted to help students to not just be receivers, but to um, own their impact in student ministry, taking um, the night, taking um, the, the, the responsibility upon themselves so that way they could lead other students. And what we've seen is this been such a blessing to us not because they're doing all the work for us. I mean, they've helped with a lot of setup and teardown, but that's helped them to even go further in their faith and in their journey. Um, they've invited people from church at the beginning, and they were excited to invite people, other teens. Hey, you're a teen, I'm a teen, let's go to Sunday night, hang together. And they did that, and we saw people that we haven't seen before. Because I can invite people, and I can invite teenagers, but you guys don't necessarily want to hang out with me. You want to hang out with other teenagers. And so it's been really cool to see that. But one story real quick, over the summer, we had a student um, serves and we had students come uh, to serve at one of the apartment outreaches for our church. And there was a teenager that was there and some of the leadership team and other students there were just really investing in this teen and talking to him and even invited him back to our youth group, which started in a couple weeks. And he came and the student leadership team welcomed him when he came, hung out with him while they were playing games, invited him to sit next to them while we were doing worship and a message, which again, I can't do. First of all, because I'll be up there for the message, but also because teens don't necessarily want to sit with leaders, they want to sit with peers. And that was such a huge impact. But then there was even another student that took it a step further and brought that teen back home because he was going to take an Uber home and then brought him back another week. And just to see the transforms lives that through the students taking ownership of their uh, faith and of the group, to see them just being more engaged Sunday nights led to other teens being more engaged. Seeing them up front helped other people to want to serve more and be more. And I don't tell you the story because we have it all together. We're still learning, it's growing in this process. But if we're trying to reimagine church and even me reimagining the student ministry, you know, it's something that we have to do together. And wherever you're at, trying to enjoy God fully, live as family, taking a risk, you know, we need to do that together as we look to Christ, our focus, and let the Holy Spirit empower us. So let's close in prayer as we go out. Father, thank you so much for the message you laid on Pastor Danny's heart for the book of Acts as being an encouragement to us of how the church was started and maybe how we should restart and reimagine our church here. And I pray that you empower the right people to do the th work of your ministry to help change this church and help change RDU. So in your name we pray, amen.